Seriously, what the hell is going on in Romania? Why do hundreds of thousands of people go out and protest in way below freezing temperatures? Well, it started as an autistic protest almost two weeks ago, then it became very serious and big on the night between January the 31st and February the 1st following a dick move by the government. And then it went into full euphoria and snowball effect from there. The good, the bad and the questions on all of this, that's our episode. Let's explore. Hello everyone and welcome to another installment of Freedom Alternative Research and Analysis. Alright, I did cover this extensive, extensively on the Romanian language channel and will continue to do so throughout this week should the need emerge. And of course this will be part of the regular podcast on Sunday night as well, but I was quite hesitant to cover this on the English language channel until the event met my policy for bringing Romanian politics here, namely to be relevant for the audience and or to have international implications. As of February the 5th, it meets both of the conditions and unlike the current Romanian government, I actually do stick with my policy. <laughs> All right. Now with that out of the way, we'll go through this the classical way, namely facts first, analysis second, speculation third and personal opinions last. So for the purposes of this video, we'll look at the following. Background story, short history of the protests, including the initial reasons for them, the state of affairs now, and then, only then, segment four, analysis, speculations and finally segment six, opinions. So get ready, cause this is going to be a bit long. <laughs> All right. Segment one, background story. You might remember that Romania made headlines back in December when the progressives all over the place were very excited of the possibility that this country would be led by a female Muslim prime minister. That idea floated around for a few days until the president rejected the nomination of Sevil Shaidech for security reasons. Her husband is a Syrian and worked with Hezbollah and within the Bashar al-Assad administration for years. The nomination of Sevil Shaidech came after the December the 11th elections in which the Social Democratic Party got a bit over 45% of the votes and entered into a coalition with the Liberal Democrat Alliance which got a bit over 5%. This coalition had thus the legitimacy to form the new government. The procedure here is that the president appoints the prime minister after consultations with the winning political party or the winning alliance. Now, the winning coalition wanted, and still wants, to impose Liviu Dragnea as prime minister, the president of the Social Democratic Party. The problem for him, though, is that under a 2001 law, he can't be a prime minister as he is a convicted felon for electoral fraud. As a result, the president had warned the coalition right from the get-go that he won't appoint Dragna or anyone else with a definitive criminal conviction, especially if it is a co corruption-related conviction. So... They tried the card with Sevil Shaideh, who is very loyal to uh, Liviu Dragnea. When that failed, the winning coalition came up with Sorin Grindanu, at the time the president of the County Council of Timish. This proposal was accepted by the president, but there was always an understanding that the shots will be called, for the most part, by Liviu Dragnea. This wasn't to the liking of the president, mind you, but the president had no legal leg to stand on to refuse this proposal by the Social Democrats, so on January the 5th, 2017, the Grindano cabinet is sworn into office. Fast forward several days and we're on January the 18th, 2017, when a proposal for a governmental executive order is put on the table by the Minister of Justice in the new cabinet. In that form, which changed several times afterwards, as we'll see, the order was about collectively pardoning all inmates serving prison sentences shorter than five years, except those convicted of violent crimes and corruption-related crimes, such as bribery and uh, <clears throat> constitution of a crime syndicate. Now, 
this is a legal term that encapsulates a lot of things that aren't a crime syndicate per se. Hence, some convicts uh, under this uh, particular article of the criminal code can get smaller than five years sentences. Now, the motivation for this presented by the Minister for Justice, Florin Yordake, was twofold. Human rights, human rights, and economics. Now, both of these motives are related to the same cause, prison overcrowding. Now, here um, it should be said that prison overcrowding is a, an issue at least in part because of a law that says that for light punishments the convict should do the time in a penitentiary as close to his or her home as possible. And since most convicts are on small petty crimes, as this country has one of the lowest levels of violent crime in the world, this resulted in prison overcrowding in low-level jails, some of them reaching occupation levels over 200%, whereas more top-tier maximum security penitentiaries remained with occupation levels way below 100%. Now, the logical solution here would have been to amend that law, but it's the government and it's a social democratic one, so expecting logic is quite a bit unreasonable. <laughs> Now, the economics part of the justification was the fact that, allegedly, the European Court of Human Rights is about to hand down a decision in May this year about prison conditions in this country, and, allegedly, that decision may involve fines and reparations imputed to the government. Now, Regardless of yours and mine political opinion on this, the order itself, at that point, was quite harmless, morally speaking. The only objections, objection could be why use short-term public debate, which is mandatory in these cases, and not work with the parliament where you already had the majority. But anyway, in the days that followed, every relevant actor chipped into the debate. The National Anti-Corruption Directorate strongly objected, citing the Constitution and claiming that the order would be unconstitutional as you can't amend the criminal code by executive order. Now, that opinion, mind you, hasn't been tested in court yet, and the previous government did amend the criminal code by executive order in May 2016, although admittedly on a much smaller and less consequential issue. However, as days got by, things started to change. The order was amended several times during the public consultation process, and it got worse and worse with every new version. On top of that, some unconfirmed reports appeared in the media, which made the situation even more tense than it needed be. But that in the next segment. <laughs> Segment 2. History of the Protests The first street protest against this happens right after the first publication, on January the 18th, but it only becomes big enough to get covered by the Romanian mainstream media on January the 22nd, when roughly 20,000 people took it to the streets in Bucharest to voice their displeasure for the fact that the government is trying to amend the criminal code via executive order. Now, this protest got even more coverage because the president himself joined the protest and made a statement from the middle of the protest. Now, let's watch that. Este inadmisibil să se schimbe legislația și zeci, sute de politicieni certați cu legea să se găsească cu dosarele curate și să continue fără de legile. Românii all right, that statement is absolutely true today, but it wasn't entirely true at that moment. At that moment, the project on the table for the order did not include pardons for politicians who tend to commit corruption-related crimes and much less any other type of crimes. Nevertheless, thousands of people kept on protesting every day between January the 22nd and January the 29th, but the protests were mostly confined to the big cities, particularly university centers, namely Bucharest, Cluj-Napoca, Timisoara, and Yash. However, until January the 31st, the protests were small outside the capital city because the issue simply wasn't big enough. If the government had been smart, they would have tamed it even further and leave it at that. But the government was not smart. On the contrary, it was 
completely idiotic. Anyway, on January the 24th, the president triggers the legal procedure to call for a referendum on this issue, arguing that since the measure is so controversial, maybe it's better to be decided via a referendum rather than the parliament or in the government. Now, the protests, while all of this was happening, the protests continued, but still remained very small compared to what they were about to become several days later. Anyway, the whole paradigm changed and sort of convinced even skeptics like me when the government conducted a huge dig move on January the, 23rd, uh, the 31st, late in the night. Now, in this country, the president only leads the government meetings in uh, exceptional situations, unlike France, where the president is always there. That's because of the semi-presidential system in place here, which is modeled after the French one. More on that in a future video where I'll explain in detail <clears throat> how the system is supposed to work. But anyway, during this period, the president did preside over a cabinet meeting in which he was reassured that the executive orders would be pushed through without further consultations. Let's watch that portion. Cunoașteți povestea că este un elefant în încăpere, dar nu se vede. Sunt doi elefanți, ordonanța de grațiere și ordonanța de modificare a codurilor penale. Evident că și despre acestea am discutat cu domnul prim-ministru mai de dimineață, iar domnia sa mi-a spus că nu va fi pusă pe ordinea de zi suplimentară această chestiune sau aceste două chestiuni privind amnistia, pardon, grațierea și modificarea codurilor. De asemenea, subliniez și sper să fiu una sentimentul domnului prim-ministru, s-a angajat ca aceste chestiuni să nu fie băgate peste noapte nicio ședință de guvern. And then, on January the 31st, very late in the night, at 11 p.m., give or take, the government pushes through with the worst version of the order of all of them, and then, in an unprecedented move, it also publishes them in the official monitor, which is the government's newspaper, at 1 a.m. in the morning. An act, be it executive order, law, ordinance, whatever, comes into force the second it's published in that newspaper, unless a later date is explicitly mentioned in the act itself. Now, this was not normal in itself, since officially nobody's working at 1 a.m. in the morning to publish stuff in the official monitor. Anyway, so they did do that, and the website of the official monitor got throttled that night as everyone was trying to read what had been published and calls to massive protests rapidly spread on social media. What eventually got published was significantly worse and suddenly gave legitimacy to most of the grievances expressed in previous days. The version that got into print included amendments to the articles in the criminal code dealing with abuse of power, misappropriation of funds and other corruption-related crimes. A provision that enraged many was the one setting a seller of 200,000 lei, or around $45,000, beneath which a crime such as misappropriation of funds would become a civil offense rather than a criminal one. This order was set to enter into force in 10 days after publication unless it is annulled or struck down by the Constitutional Court. Minutes after the publication, at around 2 a.m. in the morning, at temperatures lower than 10 degree, minus 10 in Celsius, spontaneous protests erupt in the big cities, and since then, they got bigger and bigger with every day that passed. While at 11 p.m. there were only 10 people in front of the government HQ in Bucharest, by midnight the entirety of the Victory Square in front of the building was full. Things got a, big rough, a bit rough, though not by my standards. A few snowballs thrown at the gendarmerie guarding the government HQ and a bit of tear gas, as you can see in the footage, courtesy of left-wing newspaper Adevol, was not really such a huge deal. A few harsh words were also exchanged, but that was pretty much it. Mâine seara ne stingem 100 de mii și intrăm peste aici și călcăm în picioare. Și dacă sunteți aici, o să fie la sol. Vă spun eu sigur, da? Vă rugați vă ca mâine să nu mai fiți la serviciu. 
Now the stake in all of this is this. <clears throat> in the Romanian jurisprudence, when more than one law deals uh, with the same crime, the most favorable one for the defendant is the one that should be used. So if this order would have, been to, would have to come into force even for one minute, this would compel judges to use this one, which is by far the most favorable act for those on corruption charges in all current pending cases. This rationale is that uh, one is on trial on the laws in force throughout the trial, not the laws in force at the moment when the crime was allegedly convicted. Which makes sense, since you wouldn't want people going to jail for saying a joke about Ceausescu in 1987, which was illegal at the time, but it's not today. Anyway, you get the point. The thing is that this order, uh, should it come to force, would produce effects even if it would be abolished later on in the same day. So basically, this is a technical trick to create law that has effects for things in the past, but not necessarily for the future, whereas the Constitution says that the law should produce effects only in the future, which, again, absolutely does make sense. So... With all of this in mind, the protesters declared 10 days in a row of protesting, uh, while the Superior Magistrate's Court opined that the order may indeed be unconstitutional. While all of this was happening, the Ombudsman, Victor Ciorbe, former Prime Minister in late 1990s, had said that he won't challenge the order at the Constitutional Court. This was on February the 1st. Two days later, he changed his mind following pressure from the president and decided to use his prerogative to sue the government over this order at the Constitutional Court. Again, more on how the Constitutional Court works in a future video, uh, either later this week or, la or next week. So, let's listen to the statement by the Ombudsman on February the 3rd. Mai întâi, în legătură cu calitatea procesuală activă, a avocatului poporului de a ridica această excepție. Sigur, regret că n-am fost în stare să rezist solicitărilor, presiunilor, rugăminților unora dintre dumneavoastră și miercuri dimineață v-am dat un răspuns înainte de a fi în posesia monitorului oficial și înainte de a fi verificat dacă există sau nu precedente în această materie. Oricum, îi mulțumesc, domnului președinte, pentru precizarea făcută în legătură cu existența acelui precedent. Now, at the time of that, of that statement, the protests had already hit 100,000 people in Bucharest alone and 300,000 uh, nationwide, with small towns and even remote villages holding rallies against the government's actions. This state of affairs determined even members of the Social Democratic Party to turn against their own leaders. The Minister for Business, Florin Giano, resigned from the government and several other prominent members of the Social Democratic Party resigned from their positions and some of them quit the political party altogether. It is worth mentioning that up to the moment of this recording, with all of those massive protests nationwide, every single day, Exactly one violent incident happened in Bucharest on February the 1st when several football hooligans uh, threw firecrackers and tried to start up a fight. Now, their effort was somewhat successful in the sense that they managed to stop the protest altogether before midnight, even though the initial plan was to keep it going way past midnight. But other than that, all the protests so far have been peaceful, resembling in this regard with the Tea Party protests in the United States, vehement but peaceful and especially clean. The places where protesters walked through were left spotless and the protesters went to great lengths to clean the place before leaving towards their homes. Alright, so, as you can see, the issue is quite complex and nowhere near as the headline nowhere near as simple as the headlines implied but wait it gets even more complex than that all right segment three the state of affairs now on February the 5th, the New York Times, a former newspaper, ran an article with the headline Romania's leaders back down but protesters aren't going anywhere. 
Now, this came after a day before the government had announced that it annuls the order and thus fulfilled the primary request in the previous days of protests, namely to prevent the order from being in force even for one minute. However, the protests now had evolved, or devolved, depending on how you look at things, into something bigger. The annulment of the order just isn't enough anymore. How did that happen? I'll try to explain in the next segment. But the point is that now the semi-coherent demand, besides the annulment of the order, is for the government to resign and the Social Democratic Party to be tasked to form a new cabinet. Another popular request expressed through a vulgar but popular message is for Liviu Dragnea, the de facto prime minister in the eyes of many, to be kicked to the curb from the Social Democratic Party so as to avoid having another puppet government, as most protesters see this one as being the puppet of Liviu Dragnea. As with any large protest, the requests also became more diverse. This is, uh, there is a strong contingent within the protests that demands uh, snap elections, arguing that not only this particular government has ran short of legitimacy through its actions, but that the ruling coalition itself has also become illegitimate. Now, <clears throat> this is news in progress, so by the time I publish this video, updates might occur. So I may or may not add written updates during the editing process or in the comment section. For instance, update uh, right, right as I'm recording this, uh, the order was annulled, but then it was introduced as a legislative project in the Social Democratic Majority Parliament. So uh, there's definitely news in progress on this particular aspect. <laughs> All right, segment four, analysis of the protests. And this is the segment where I piss off a lot of people, or maybe not. Now, as I showed you in the previous video with the uh, Sunday mega protest here in Cluj, where close to 50,000 people showed up, by far the largest protest since the revolution and widely surpassing the one against ACTA, which at the time had been the largest in Europe against ACTA, the voices are pretty diverse. I've seen and heard everything there uh, and captured uh, most of it on uh, on tape, from militant conservatives to militant communists and everything imaginable and unimaginable in between. I've seen a praise kek poster for crying out loud. Now, <clears throat> this has obvious advantages, namely that it makes the opportunists job harder in their attempt to seize the protest. With such a politically diverse pool of people, you'd better not try to push an agenda on them, cause it ain't gonna work. However, this also has serious disadvantages, namely that it favors the push of more extreme policies that are still within the confines of the initial purpose, namely uh, to protect the current anti-corruption framework and prevent the government from undermining it. What I mean by more extreme is policies that aren't well thought out. So, for instance, the request for the current government to resign is definitely not an extreme request. Neither is the request for snap elections necessarily. But it is definitely not well thought out for several reasons. For starters, there is no wide systemic political crisis. The parliament is not hung and having an act declared unconstitutional, should that happen, is not reason enough. All governments have a few acts struck down by the Supreme Court or the Constitutional Court during uh, their tenure. This is true anywhere in the world, not just in Romania. Secondly, as impressive as these protests may be, they still do represent four to seven times less than the total number of votes the Social Democrats got almost two months ago in the general elections. So there is no guarantee that snap elections won't yield a very similar score for the Social Democrats uh, and their coalition partners. Thirdly, calling snap elections would create an actual political crisis in itself and bring serious instability. The exchange rate has already been going up in the previous week and several big investments have been postponed already because of perceived political instability. And this is without any actual political instability. Now imagine what would creating legit instability would do to the economy. And finally, fourthly, 
There is no serious alternative right now, much to my sadness. The national liberals are an absolute mess and the Save Romanian Union, the U USR or the Hipsters Party is cancer. And all the others are just too small to matter. So again, apply the Thomas Sowell test, especially the first two questions of the test. Compared to what and at what cost? Now, I was saying in a previous segment that the protests have evolved or devolved, depending on how you look at things, into something bigger, and that the annulment of the order just isn't enough anymore. Part of how did this happen, I just explained it. There was room for taking the protests to the next level in terms of demands. But now, uh, for now, for instance, they aren't worryingly radical. In fact, they're remarkably moderate, defying my fears that I was expressing a few days ago on Facebook. But nevertheless, the risks are still there. The reason I'm saying this is because parts of this protest, uh, though by no means the majority, but a significant minority for sure, is essentially an intra-leftist fight. The struggle is between the old left, represented by PSD, and the new left, politically represented for the most part by the Save Romania Union or the Hipsters Party, but also by various other minuscule but radical NGOs, many of them with outside funding. This is visible to anyone not fully conquered by the general euphoria of the protests who keeps an eye on what Wusere has been doing lately, namely to twist the general messages in the streets to fit their political style and then take those messages in seemingly ad hoc protests within the parliament's building. Take for instance this picture, posted by U USR IMP Christian Gine. Uh, the lady with the red poster with the... Um, <clears throat> white writing on it is a militant radical communist that makes the old Bolsheviks in the PSD blush in shame with her radicalism. The man behind her, Mihai Gotiu, is a militant eco-Marxist, and the lady in the lower right of the picture with the Romanian flag on her shoulder is a Bernie Sanders style of Bolshevik who last autumn still claimed to be fluent in Moldavian language, because in her opinion Moldavian is an actual language. This is basically an alternative fact that only Putin and old Bolsheviks believe, but don't mention that, or the beautiful and free youngsters will call you a social democrat. <laughs> As I was saying, the new left is schizophrenic more so than the old left. Now. The intra-leftist struggle is just one facet of the protests. A large enough chunk of the protests, I would dare to argue that it's an equally large chunk to the one of the new leftists, is formed by people who are generally apathetic towards politics but for various reasons decided to join in this particular political battle. Just ask 100 of these kinds of people and you'll get 100 different answers. These people are very likely to drop off the political battlefield for another several years after this episode ends. Another faction of the protests is uh, right-wingers, um, in the sense of capitalists, business owners, libertarians, etc., etc. And it's usually the case, and as it's usually the case on the right, this faction has a lot of internal divisions. But nevertheless, it is the side that tends to drive the messages, like uh, PSD, the red, red Plague, and the side that comes with helicopter signs, which, quite frankly, is nice. I mean. Flying the helicopter is a cool activity in itself. <laughs> anyway, there are also some smaller factions, uh, such as the religious right, the anarcho-communists, the shit posters, and so on and so forth. The religious right is worth mentioning in the sense that it is split on these protests. The pro-life and pro-family faction is present at these protests, whilst other factions of the religious right are outright hostile to the protests altogether, using reasoning that I have to admit, I simply do not understand. Now, <clears throat> on top of all of these, there are the opportunists, who try to put themselves at the forefront of the protests in order to drive attention to their own causes. Most of these tend to be on the fringe left. 
What we call the fringe left in Romania is the absolute mainstream left in Western Europe, namely feminism, cultural Marxism, multiculturalism, and all the other types of degeneracy that is largely absent in Eastern Europe, which makes Eastern Europe incredibly safe and great in these times of turmoil. One example of this is the Norwegian activist Kai Fritjof Brand Jakobsen, who resides here in Cluj-Napoca, who made a video in English that went viral, summing up uh, the current situation, but also introducing a small amount of fake news and partisanship to the extreme left, specifically this portion. These are the largest demonstrations which have ever taken place in Romania, but they're not the first. Just several years ago, the country also erupted in demonstration when Prime Minister at the time tried to pass a law which would have made it possible for a foreign company to carry out cyanide mining in the mountains in Romania. The people rose up and stopped that project. Well, that's just not true. It's not even an oversimplification, it's flat out false. The issue he's talking about is the Roshia Montana Gold Corporation scandal, which was actually a scandal created out of thin air by the extreme left. Also, he has the timeline wrong. This Norwegian SJW shows Ponta when talking about this, but the scandal started long before Victor Ponta was a prime minister. I remember I wrote about this in 2011 when Emil Bok, the current mayor of this city of Cluj, was the prime minister. Also, the Roshia Montana saga ended on December the 30th, 2015, many, many, many years after the street hysteria of the extreme left had ended. So the idea that the people rose up and shut down this project is a flat out lie. Unlike now, the only people interested in that scandal have been the extreme eco-Marxist left, not the people in general. And the termination of the project came years after those protests had ended, so crediting the protests for this is disingenuous at best, and quite frankly, fake news. Now this Norwegian guy also tried in 2015 to set up a mass rally in support of opening our borders to refugees and the religion of pieces. Less than 50 people showed up, all of them known degenerates to all the normal people in this town. Completely unsurprising, this guy is the executive director of the Soros-founded NGO, the Department of Peace Operations. This guy is essentially an opportunist. He's using the protests to draw attention to his extreme causes. And his activity also harms the protests because the Social Democrats won on the platform of opposing Soros Georgiou's activities. His involvement provides undue legitimacy to the PSD's claims that these protests are instigated by Soros. They are not but with cucks like this Norwegian guy inserting themselves into the discussion, the feeble minds who tend to vote for PSD suddenly have an example. Also, it's remarkably, uh, it's, it's probably worth mentioning that uh, at one point, a Social Democrat affiliated TV station had claimed that adult protesters got 100 lei, that would be 24 bucks to show up, children got 50 lei or 12 bucks, and owners of dogs would get 30 lei per dog that they bring to the protest. Now, this has become in itself a running joke by now, as protesters are calculating how long it would take uh, Soros to go bankrupt if he would actually pay even a fraction of the protesters. Obviously, the Soros claim is bonkers, but having this cretin inserting himself at the forefront is a negative in and of itself. Another example of opportunism was the organizer of the so-called Solidarity Protests in Kishino, Moldova, organized largely by the pro-Russian faction led by the known KGB infiltrator Renato Usati. This was a weird one for sure, I mean, the most corrupt anti-national Duginists protesting in solidarity with an anti-corruption uh, string of protests in the neighboring country. Yeah, right, and pigs can fly. What it actually means is that the Duginists have identified, correctly I might add, an opportunity to spread some more of their ideas. This could get dangerous if the protests last long enough. Let's not forget that Moldova is led by a guy who thinks annexing the eastern part of Romania is not only a good idea, but an achievable one. Now, 
You can see why I maintain a degree of skepticism to the generalized euphoria, even while I agree with most of the tenets of the protests, but more on that later. Uh, our final aspect, uh, one final aspect to be mentioned in this segment is the solidarity protest in Bulgaria, which, from what I can tell, has been much more sincere than the ones in Moldova. Now, this led many analysts to point out that Romania is the de facto regional leader in combating corruption, being by far the least corrupt in the region. And it is thus little surprise uh, that the idea th that this can be done, combating, combating corruption can actually be done, is now slowly picked up by regular people in neighboring nations, especially when considering that the powers that be in Bulgaria get chills down their spines whenever the Romanian model of tackling corruption is mentioned in any context. Now, all of that is true, but it's also true that Bulgarians aren't exactly our friends, as there is quite a lot of historic animosity between the two countries. Not without reason, mind you, but just saying. To me, the protest in Sofia is like an honest um, and sincere protest in Bucharest in support of Hungary. Not impossible, but largely unlikely. With that said, I sure do hope that it was for real and the Bulgarians pick up on the idea and start implementing it in their country and maybe even improve it and make it work even better than we did. I mean, when we started doing this, tackling corruption, we stepped into uncharted territory, so they should have now hindsight view on the issue of corruption and maybe come up with better methods. All right. Uh, there is more to be said here, but I'd like to keep this video under uh, 120 minutes. <laughs> Alright, so segment 5, speculations. Now, I could spend an hour just discussing the speculations around these protests, so what I'll do is to limit myself to the biggest ones. The first one I mentioned in the previous segment, the protests are funded by Soros speculation. As I said, this originates from the halls of the Social Democratic Party and it is a lingering talking point from the campaign trail. Now, it is true that there is a link between Soros and the USR, but that doesn't mean the current protests have anything to do with that. For starters, USR is still a small political party, and most of their members joined the protests a little bit later and not from the beginning. This speculation was amplified, as I was saying, by RTV, which is a social democratic affiliated TV station, which speculated not only that the protesters had been paid, but also uh, forwarded exact amounts that they had allegedly gotten. Now, there were also speculations on the side of the uh, pro-protesters, which kind of fueled my skepticism, by the way. For instance, the conservative MEP Monika Makovei claimed in the European Parliament that the government was trying to abolish the National Anti-Corruption Directorate. Let's watch. And I would like to say something. It was announced yesterday that the election is coming to a Vor să desfințez de Direcția Națională Anticorupție. Vor să nu mai fie anchetați. Now that was literally fake news. There was never a question of abolishing the DNA, nor a question of merging it uh, with uh, the ICOT, which is the Directorate for Investigating Organized Crime Syndicates and Terrorism, something like that. But many did believe this claim. There is simply no evidence for it, but who needs that? Just like many believe the claim that the government wants to pardon rapists and murderers. This was claimed in the streets before January the 31st as, and what I like to call the autistic period of the protests. Again, that was a lie. From the second this scandal started in January the 18th, it was never a question of freeing rapists or murderers. Now, since we're at the topic at the European Parliament, the uh, old left MEPs also peddled fake news in the European Parliament, like the Liberal Democrat Noika Nicolai. Listen to this. In paranteză, fie spus, un minunea că în România drepturile omului sunt un lux. Da, domnule președinte, sunt un lux pentru că această curte constituțională a consacrat faptul că se fac abuzuri cu privire la dreptul de apărare, la faptul că sunt interceptări fără mandat de la judecător, că abuzul în serviciu este o incriminare prea largă, că uh, dreptul cetățeanului la garanțiile procesuale nu este respectat. 
What she's referring to is a set of rulings by the Constitutional Court regarding the extent of powers granted to the National Anti-Corruption Directorate. The problem with what she's saying is that those rulings went exactly the opposite for the, the opposite way from what she's saying. No, the Constitutional Court did not enshrine abuses into the practices of the DNA, quite the opposite. The Constitutional Court curtailed the powers of the DNA and of the intelligence community in investing criminal cases pertaining to corruption, which quite frankly was largely a good thing. I mean, too much power in the hands of one agency is problematic regardless of the topic in question, be it anti-corruption, the environment, or any other topic, really. Another speculation se uh, severely peddled by the TV stations affiliated with PSD is that the current protests uh, are a movement of people they dubbed as Johannes, i.e. supporters of President Johannes, who want to bring back the previous Cholos cabinet. Now, this is an example of scientific lying, namely 20% truth, 30% spin, and 50% outright lie. It is true that most people in the protests did vote for Klaus Johannes in the 2014 presidential elections, but most people who voted for Johannes didn't do so out of love for the former mayor of Sibiu, but because the counter-candidate was basically Hillary Clinton, though I would dare to argue that even Victor Ponta was better than Hillary Clinton. I mean, at the very least, while he was prime minister, he didn't try to sell our nuclear resources to the KGB like Hillary did. Anyway, while it is true that a majority, though by no means all, of the people protesting now in the streets did vote for Johannes, it is disingenuous to uh, disingenuous spin to call them Johannes, since the president didn't gather a movement around him, neither when he won or nor today. The outright lie part in this narrative is the desire to bring back the previous Cholos cabinet. That simply ain't happening. Even the radicals who want snap elections aren't into Cholos that much. It is simply a lie to paint the protesters as being about that. On the other hand, this speculation was made possible because the president joined the protests in one of the days, as I've shown earlier in this video. Now, there is an entire separate debate on whether he should have done that or not. Those who say that uh, he should not have done that argue that the constitutional role of the president is to be a mediator between the powers of the state and him sidling, siding overtly with the protesters delegitimized his role in mediating this conflict, thus needlessly prolonging this situation. Those who say that he did very well to join the protests argue that he can still mediate the conflict and that it was an exceptional situation in which the government left him few options other than overtly siding with the people by attending a rally and calling for a referendum. Now, quite frankly, I don't really care which one is right in this uh, particular sub-sub issue. But the fact remains that the speculation was made possible and became mildly successful amongst PSD fans because the president was there. All right, enough with that. Let's get to the final segment. segment 6 opinions now right let's keep this short uh, so far I laid out as many facts as possible and kept my personal opinions to an absolute minimum not because I don't have opinions of my own but because I presume that most people who will end up watching this don't know all the details since well since you all asked for coverage well this is it now my position changed several times as new facts became known to me and also as the situation changed my default position with any protests is, I don't really care, because most of the times the protests in this country have little to no relevance to me and my interests. The last time I cared about a protest was in 2012, when the same PSD tried to pull, the sa uh, tr tried to pull some really, really nasty shit. That conflict included quite a bit of violence and was settled via a referendum. In this particular case, my initial view of the protests, as can be seen in my Romanian language podcasts of January the 22nd and January the 29th, was one of mixture between don't really care and a bit of disdain. 
The reason was very simple. The claims weren't matching reality and the protests also looked more like autistic screeching than anything else. At the time, the only valid reason for protests was that amending the criminal code via executive order was bad practice. But, you know, I felt at the time, and still do, for the most part, that that, in and of itself, wasn't reason enough to take it to the streets. After all, the previous cabinet did exactly the same thing in May 2016, and no one protested then, even though it was still bad practice at that time as well. Basically, I considered it to be a minor issue. However, I did drop the disdain part entirely on the night uh, between January 31st and February the 1st, because I read the actual order published in the middle of the night. I could no longer treat the issue with disdain since now the claims did match reality and the issue did indeed suck much more than it had until that moment. So I replaced the disdain with skepticism from that moment on because that's my natural instinct. When I see mass euphoria, my first instinct is to question it. On top of that, several facts of the cause uh, said uh, and did uh, some, rather, some, uh, some fans of the cause did some rather appalling things, such as publishing Dragnea's home address, publishing the Prime Minister's children's phone numbers, and things of that nature. <clears throat> what I feared the most was rapid and uncontrolled radicalization, which would lead to needless violence and the degeneration of the situation. Now, all of the things were in place for a perfect storm, and to a much lesser extent, they still are. But as I said, when reality proves me wrong, I move, because I'd rather be correct than consistent. And reality proved me, at least in part, wrong, in the sense that after February the 1st, violence was totally absent, and in spite of the increased and increasing mass euphoria, things did not degenerate further. And that's great! I mean, I'm not joking when I routinely say in my videos that I love to be wrong, because usually when I'm wrong, things go well. However, with that being said, I still think it's not a good idea to prolong this much longer, especially if this cabinet resigns, which may indeed happen, I guess we'll have to wait and see. The longer this continues, the higher the economic cost uh, for the country, which is why the only protest that I enthusiastically support, dare I say euphorically, in this case, is the tax strike, or the fiscal strike. The enemy is the government, not the rest of the country. A tax strike constrains the government whilst not hurting the productive individuals. Creating instability, on the other hand, harms everyone, and for me, economic issues matter quite a lot. And just like I said in segment 4, the fact of the matter remains that a credible alternative doesn't yet exist. While flying the helicopter with Dragda is definitely much fun, Wiping Pesede altogether right now, instead of doing it in a lawful election, doesn't exactly help, because realistically, Pesede would win the snap elections. Maybe not with 45%, but at best, you'd get a hung parliament. Now, how's that going to help? What those caught by the euphoria, and understandably so, don't seem to realize is that the Pesede voters didn't go anywhere. They're still out there, and acting hostile towards them isn't helping either. And sadly, most folks in the anti PSD camp do act very hostile and divisive towards them. And that has got to change. As for the legal claim that PSD qualifies for being declared unlawful altogether for uh, attempting to uh, undermine the lawful order of the country, quite frankly, that sounds great. But as with all revolutions, one must ask, and then what? Again, making Pesede illegal won't t tackle the real issue, namely that their way of doing politics still has fans. Nevertheless, if that works, it would still be fun to watch. I mean, I have to admit that. Emotionally speaking, it just sounds great. Considering how much I loathe this political party, severely disrupting their operations as they'd be forced to reorganize if they're declared illegal would be delightful to watch in and of itself. However, <clears throat> over the medium run, the way I see it, we'd better get to work in the next four years in agitprop for hearts and minds on the ground, as I've been doing for close to two years now. That will ensure the end of PSD style of politics. It's hard, 
and ostensibly not fun, or at least nowhere near as fun as the fuck drug nap means. It also takes longer, but that's how lasting change is done. Anyway, I guess um, we'll have to live and see. At least I had several good laughs with these protests so far. I mean, some of the memes and signs were absolutely hilarious. <laughs> But over the long run, this is not sustainable. It's not sustainable for PSD to continue to refuse to reform itself, and it's not sustainable for the rest of the parties to keep relying on the large segment of voters who outright refuse PSD and tend to vote, uh, t tend to behave themselves on uh, election uh, day as uh, I'm going to vote for anyone but PSD when elections are due. So these things are not sustainable. Uh, the social democrats must reform themselves or otherwise. Either sooner or later, they will be wiped. They will have the uh, exact same fate as the Penetece Day, if anyone remembers that. I'll leave some links in English in the low bar uh, for that reference. And with all of that being said, thank you all for watching. I hope this puts uh, things more into context for some of you. Thank you all for your constant and generous support, and um, I'll see you around on Freedom Alternative.